Right, well, hello everyone, um, and welcome back to TOSP, the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Elf Eldridge. I'm Amy Woodcraft. And today, as usual, we've got our um, eclectic list of various different science stories from the previous week. We do indeed. Um, jumping straight in, uh, some of these sort of big news, in fact, over the last few hours really, is the descent of a satellite Um uh, the upper atmosphere research satellite, in fact, belonging to NASA, into our atmosphere. Uh, most of it was scheduled to burn up, but there's about a bus size amount of it that wasn't going to. And it was thought that it was going to split up into sort of, I think, 25, 26 pieces, somewhere like that, um, and hit the Earth in various places. And there's been a lot of uh, talk about where it might be. Um, it went into sort of a tumbling fall, which makes it very, very difficult to predict where these pieces will come down. Um, and the news over the night, which is when it um, when it came down, is that we may never know, <laughs> says uh, NASA's chief orbital uh, debris scientist. So it looked like it plunged into the Pacific Ocean, somewhere between Hawaii and the uh, western coast of North America. Um, there have been reports from Canada from people seeing they saw stuff come down, but it, it's thought that the reports aren't accurate because it, it wouldn't have been when they would have been able to see them. So, yeah, currently it looks like it hit the sea. Uh, a fun um, just piece of news, NASA put the odds of a person getting hit by a piece of satellite debris at 1 in 21 trillion. But, yeah, so far it looks like nobody got hurt, um, and I'm sure there'll be some great jokes coming out of it in the near future. <laughs> But don't expect a quick recovery. Um, I've heard the Pacific Ocean is rather large. Yes, it is indeed. All right, the next thing is quite specifically New Zealand from me. It's a report published this week entitled, Do People with Doctoral Degrees Get Jobs in New Zealand a Post-Study? And simply, no, no, they don't. Which a lot of people in the kind of educational community could probably have told you. Yep. The actual numbers is that around 65% of the doctoral cohort were employed in New Zealand four years after they last studied. So that means that mm. that remaining 35% were not, which is uh, hardly unsurprising. There were some other mitigating factors. So um, people with PhDs were more likely to be overseas four years after completing their doctorate if they were younger, particularly if, I, if they were under 30, if they were Asians, if they were graduates in the natural and physical sciences as opposed to the social sciences. Um, and that actually puts New Zealand's um, retention rate of its doctoral cohort below that of Canada and the United Kingdom. Hmm. The report puts that down to a lack of opportunities, which is uh, possible, I guess. But um, just to put some numbers and figures on it, 21% of all those people that they studied, all the postdoctoral graduates, were never employed in New Zealand after the years, in the four years uh, after that they after they graduated. Mm. And of the graduates that were less than 30, um, only 57% stayed in New Zealand and gained employment, um, which really kind of puts things into stark contrast because we have really, really good education system here. Mm. We produce some wonderful graduates, and then they go... <laughs> And they go overseas. <laughs> and they, yeah. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, a lot of what I hear anecdotally, at least, is that it, uh, it often comes down to people just really struggling to find work. Uh, yeah, so something to, to think about, certainly. Um, um, I believe it's on the radars of a lot of people, but it's always nice to see studies like this that are able to put some really sort of good numbers down. And there is uh, a lot of us out there trying to kind of fix that problem. Absolutely. Don't know how much success we're having, but, you know. Yeah, it takes fine. time. <laughs> um, right, the next one is uh, actually all about Aborigines and humanity and stuff, and this is quite interesting. So to put a bit of context in, uh, one of the predominant theories about how human beings spread over the planet is that they did it sort of in, in one mass migration out of Africa and they, they, they spread then over Europe and Asia and, and everything like that and um, sea levels were lower and stuff like that so it was often a, a little bit easier. Now there is some interesting new evidence uh, DNA taken from a lock of hair from an Aboriginal man who um, donated it in the early 1920s, so about 100 years ago, uh, has been analyzed um, using some very interesting new uh, modeling capabilities, uh, genetic modeling capabilities, and it looks like that one migration thing may not in fact be true, because this suggests that um, Aboriginal Australians were the first to separate from other modern humans um, about 70,000 years ago, which is quite a long time. Um, so you can think about it, well, what it looks like uh, happened was that the Aboriginal population sort of left about 70,000 years ago, um, with the remaining humans staying around sort of North Africa and the Middle East until 24,000 years ago, which meant that 
when they started spreading out to colonize Europe and Asia, the Aborigines had already been in Australia for 25,000 years. It's a, it's a very, very interesting um, piece of information. Now, archaeological remains have suggested uh, that they were in Australia from around 50,000 years ago, but it, this is this is even longer, um, and really sort of puts into stark, uh, not contrast, but, but uh, I guess highlights... <clears throat> The amazing, uh, rights they have, I guess, to, <laughs> to the land, having been there for so very long. Wow, that's, uh, that's absolutely incredible. Um, totally shaking up our ideas of how humankind colonized the globe, and I guess it really brings into stark mm. contrast how little we actually know. Absolutely. It does say in the article that it would have been quite easy for them to get to Australia. Um, the sea levels were much lower, and they'd only have had to do one small sea crossing to get from Africa to, uh, to Australia. Oh, when you consider the number of uh, huge sea crossings they did after <laughs> that using just the stars, then that doesn't really surprise me at all. No. Okay, uh, other end of the spectrum now, um, nanotechnology, <laughs> briefly. Uh, an article we picked up on Physics World, but that originally came from Nature Nanotechnology, my favorite journal of all time. <laughs> um, the particular article is called Cells Dine on Nanotubes with Dire Results. So carbon nanotubes, this new kind of wonder form of carbon that's been found in all sorts of things from soot to um, oh, all other bits and pieces that aren't coming to me at the moment, are quite well known to be quite toxic to a lot of cells. And yeah. the mechanism behind that isn't really too well known. What a bunch of researchers have just discovered is that when carbon nanotubes stick onto the outside of the cells, they don't just kind of roll around. What they do is they get picked up by the receptor in the membranes of the cells themselves and then they get turned on the end so they're sticking up perpendicular to the surface of the cell and the cell actually sucks them in because it thinks they're a nanoparticle like a nanosphere a really small cluster of carbon that the cell would usually take up and then digest and convert into energy so it starts sucking in this nanotube and then it realizes it's not small it's really really long and at this point the cell goes ah, ah, and freaks out and sends distress signals to the rest of the immune system which causes inflammation and cell death and and a lot of the um, uh, dire results that you see when cells are treated with carbon nanotubes. The other interesting thing, so it kind of acts a bit like uh, how we think asbestos affects cells. Yeah. So that obviously has really big implications for the whole carbon nanotube industry because mm. you really don't want this happening. I guess another lesson is don't eat carbon electronics, which is well, that too. self-standard. <laughs> but the other cool thing from this particular report that they found out is that if you cut off the end, because these nanotubes have nice round ends, they kind of look like um, Buckminster fullerenes cut in half. Mm. They just look like soccer balls uh, at a nano scale, if you cut off the round end and leave it with a abrupt straight edge, the cells don't actually take up the nanotubes. That makes sense because they don't confuse it for a sphere of any sort. Yeah, they're just like, well, that's something weird. Let's leave it outside the cell and not take it right. up. So there is some really interesting, perhaps we can modify the ends um, and that will change the cellular uptake and thus how damaging they are. That's that's really brilliant news because, yeah, the carbon nanotube thing is, is of so much interest and they're so useful. We can't really, I guess, sensibly sort of say no to the industry. We've got to figure out a way to, to fix the problem. Rather and than before we, we move on to the next thing, I should also say that this only applies to the smallest of the small nanotubes. Yep. So bigger nanotubes aren't taken up and they aren't as lethal. No, cellular pores are pretty small. Yeah. <laughs> they don't admit of a lot. Okay, cool. Um Talking of things that are pretty cool and, and molecular and awesome, um, some of you may have heard about a game called Fold It, which came out in, I think it was about 2009. And basically the idea is to use human brains. It's kind of like distributed computing, like uh, SETI and, and stuff like that. But instead of using computers that aren't being used, they're using human brains um, to look at protein folding because it's very, very complicated. Basically, proteins uh, start out uh, with amino acids strung like uh, like pearls on a string, really. And then <clears throat> the, the order of the amino acids and a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't really understand so far results in uh, the string folding up into a protein with a very specific three-dimensional shape. And that shape is um, often uh, what decides the, the function of the protein. So if scientists are looking to come up with novel drugs or, or anything, really, they need to understand the, the dimensions of proteins. And it doesn't work, in, for example, on microscopes because you look like somebody took a, a lump of spaghetti and just kind of smushed it flat. You don't get that three-dimensional structure. So with that in mind, there was this awesome game called Fold It that was designed a few years ago. And it throws people at the task of uh, folding proteins. And uh, big news this week was that um, a whole bunch of gamers who playing Fold It have figured out... Um, the structure of uh, a monomeric protease enzyme, which is basically the cutting agent um, used 
by retroviruses such as AIDS. HIV. Um, uh, sorry, HIV. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> I apologize for that. I should know better. Um, yes, so they've, they've figured it out, which is really great because it means the scientists can get on with um, sort of figuring out what to do about this enzyme. You know, looking at it, is it potentially any kind of a treatment thing? What, what can we find out more? Uh, it was published in Science, and, and this is really cool. Um, the gamers involved in figuring out the structure are actually named as authors right alongside the scientists. Oh, really? That's yeah, fantastic. That's never happened before. And, and so the scientists involved are, are, are super chuffed because what they're saying, sorry, Seth Cooper, in fact, one of Foldit's uh, creators, are saying it's, it's really cool because games provide a, a framework for bringing together the strengths of both computers and humans. So this, this paper shows that gaming, science, and computation can be used to, to do stuff that I mean, we have not been able to do before. Scientists have been working with computer models on the structure of this enzyme for years and had not gotten anywhere. And the, com the gamers did in, I think, a few weeks or a few months, really, really quickly. So that's cool. There's also a wiki. If you're interested in Foldage, you can download it. There's a wiki. Uh, people post all kinds of strategies and tactics for it. Some people play it very competitively in teams. It's it's great. <laughs> it's, it's great fun as well, actually. I've just got to say, as a kind of Folder addict, as I was a wee while ago, back when I had free time, um, <laughs> Folder is actually a great deal of fun to play. It's like a three-dimensional version of Tetris. Yeah. But there's other examples uh, than just Folder of using human's unique ability to see patterns and mm. manipulate things in the three-dimensional space. Um, there's a website called Galaxy Zoo where you identify and catalogue galaxies in a similar way, and that's allowing us to generate these huge catalogues of galaxies that we can... We can't get a computer to identify because they're too complex. But if you just look at them, you can see them. So there's mm. all sorts of ways that human beings are interfacing. Yes, I, I, I think we're doing something similar like that with m pictures of Mars or the moon as well, getting people to look for um, novel features and then yeah. try and catalog them. And, and yeah, if, you, if you've ever got some free time, a lot of these things are, are just so much fun to do, and you're contributing to science in, in about the best way. And you might end up as an author on a paper. <laughs> you might indeed. <laughs> That's much easier than studying. Why don't we just do that? <laughs>